over the next five years, many colleges will suffer, and some will disappear because of student loans. Now, what's the connection? Well, the connection is for all the money. As soon as you all who had student loans sign the papers, that money goes to only one place. It goes to colleges. And colleges have become so addicted on this flow of money that if anything interrupted that flow, they would have serious financial difficulty. Let's step back for a second and say, what is a student loan? Well, it's really uh, an oxymoron. It's uh, something created by Dr. Seuss that has the head of a cuddly koala bear with the body of a snake. It has a uh, charitable uh, um, intention with the demand for repayment. Now, you don't get student loans because you're good credit. You get student loans because you have no credit. But make no mistake about it. A student, uh, money that has to be repaid with interest is not financial aid. Now, colleges have a problem with this dependency. But is it a big problem? Is it a problem worthy of a TED Talk? <laughs> well, if you look at the size over here, that number is over $1 trillion. That is the amount of the uh, student loans nationally. 36 million people, almost the population of California, have student loans outstanding right now. Look at how fast that number is going up. If I talk, if we talk for 18 minutes, it will go up by 3 million bucks. And at that rate, it will go, it will double in just a few years. That number looks strong, but in fact, that number is very weak. Because behind that number are millions of students who have defaulted and deferred on their debt. Instead of soaring to the moon, it's being cut off at the knees. Now, to understand student loans, especially those out here who raise their hands, you have to understand the humanity of the issue, the humanness. So I've asked my good friend and colleague, Laura Assad, to tell you her personal story about student loans. Thank you, Bob. I'm 27 years old, and I have been out of college for five years now. I have $25,000 in loans right now. Combined with my husband, it's $80,000. Now, I have one daughter and one on the way, and I'm afraid of what it's going to look like by the time they're going off to college. We don't know how to help them because we'll be, we'll be in so much debt and we'll still be paying these loans for when that time comes. Now, I'm a first-generation student. I came from the Dominican Republic, country where education is close to free. No student loans are being taken out by my family. So I come to this country, and I'm off to high school, and I think, you know, I'm all set. A lot of my teachers and guidance counselors are telling me that, I'm, that I'm, I will be all set because I was a low-income student. So I went up to UMass Amherst with that mentality, not knowing what was really going on in my award letter or any of the items that were on there that included Pell, loans, or anything else that would cause me to be in debt. They told me I was fine, so I didn't have to worry about it. So now, I get to UMass, I'm in my dorm, I start getting bills coming in there. And I said, well, what is this? I thought I was all set, right? I go to financial aid, and all they could offer was more loans. They offered me jobs and other, and other options that would require me to pay them back as soon as I uh, started working. And that wasn't an option for me because my family had no savings. 
My family didn't have a plan because they didn't understand the student loan system coming to this country. So what could I do? Just like anybody else, I had to sign them. That was my only option. So, like I said, 20 years from now, I'm still gonna be paying this debt. I went to a state school and I'm one of the lucky ones. There are other people out there that are paying way more money than I'm paying right now. My minimum payment is $700 each month, combined with my husband. Again, I'm one of the lucky ones. I have a great family and a great job, and I feel very fortunate. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Now, starting with that figure of Dexter and Laura, $80,000, Let's go up and look at this problem again from the level of the colleges. And if I could have, yes, I do this myself, thank you. <laughs> so uh, this is the uh, college tuition machine. Now notice up at the top, you have all those red globs. Those are student loans coming down into the machine. That's the fuel. Now inside the machine, you have uh, Everything is paid for. Uh, college president's salaries, the professor's salaries, uh, the lab bill, the soup in the kitchen, everything is paid for. And after four years, the machine disgorges a graduate. So there at the bottom, you'll see, uh, is a uh, graduate, he's plopped out. Uh, he has a uh, mortarboard, which hopefully means he can get a job, but you know that's a problem. But nowadays, the graduates come out with their own ball and chain. This is the student debt that they'll carry with them for the rest of their life. Uh, let's uh, look at this in terms of uh, how much are those red student loans coming into the system? How much fuel is coming in? Well, if you talk, it depends on colleges, type of colleges. If you talk about our major state colleges, which graduate the majority of our students, think U Michigan, they depend on 45% of their tuition coming from the government in the form of student loans. That's a huge percentage, almost half. Another thing about that, though, is that the student loans are growing much faster than tuition is growing. So over the past 10 years, tuition has grown by about 72%, a big number, a number bigger than inflation. But student loans have grown by over 500%. So student loans are pushing up tuition more and more and more. In fact, it's flooding the machine. Now, with the, in order to understand this, we have to really look at what this looks like at the level of um, independent colleges. So here we have Syracuse University and George Washington University. They're at about the 30% range. 30% sounds small compared to the, some of the figures I've talked about today, but 30% of a budget the hole that you have to fill is huge. Syracuse University knows it has a problem. It's probably the most innovative uh, university in America today in trying to find an alternative to student loans. But let's move down the scale to the state schools, Penn State, UMass Amherst, University of Oregon. You see the number moving up, 42%, 47%, 56%. University of Oregon, to open up, must get 56% of its tuition from a student loan wire that comes in in September and in January. Well, for a system to get so out of hand, there must be enablers. And the there were really three. We've done the research, and we found out that the first enabler is you. That's right. Whenever you pick a college for your child or influence your child with prestige over value, you cause student loans to go up. Uh, we all are, uh, learn to use uh, reach, safety, fit. Well, all the less expensive schools are in the safety range. They're often the state schools. But as you climb that ladder, 
they get up to the prestigious, expensive schools, and you need more student loans. Some of you might be one percenters out there. Any one percenters? <laughs> no. Okay. Well, one percenters might say, oh, Popsy's uh, trust fund is going to take care of this for our kid. There's no problem. But I can play uncle with Popsy. If, they, if, if he says he can afford the $60,000 top tuition in the United States, the way this is going, how about 75000 a year? How about 100000 It It gets too high. Now, the second enabler are those among us that really want the low income student to go to school. These people were really the first ones who created student loans back in 1965. They saw the amount of resources back then is too little, so they made a pact with the devil. And they said, I will allow the low income student to borrow money. Now that the system has blown up, they're scared. They know that if there's nothing, if, if it does blow up, there's nothing behind student loans that will allow low income kids to go to college. And you know something? They're right. Now, the third group of enablers are college presidents. They wanted me to, uh, to say thank you today for the first trillion dollars. Uh, it was wonderful, and they're really looking forward to the second trillion dollars that you as taxpayers are going to send them. That's swell. So, uh, implicit in this talk today is the idea is something is going to happen to student loans. Well, let's just think about that for a second. Have you heard that the government's planning to cut back on student loans? I haven't heard that. In fact, I heard two presidential candidates in a debate a week or so ago say both affirm uh, uh, student loans. But there is something on the other side. There are rumblings. And the rumblings you've heard and, on, and you've read are that somehow there's a bubble being created, a student loan bubble. And if this we're going to have something like the uh, mortgage meltdown. Another thing that you may not know about, over 700,000 students have sound, signed a petition for a bailout. We had the bank bailout, we had the auto bailout, we had the mortgage bailout. Do you think we're going to get out of this without a student bailout? No chance. They're our kids. They're voters. Uh, and any bailout would mean huge losses to the government. So, the, <laughs> the question is, are colleges and students going to hold hand and go over that cliff like Thelma and Louise? I think not. I think not because unlike the mortgage crisis where there were many actors, here there's really only one big actor. It's the government. That's the big lender. And they can go to any scenario they want. And they'll probably go to a scenario that looks a lot like what's happened to the medical industry and hospitals over the past 10 to 15 years. That is, they'll, they'll uh, go to colleges and they'll simply say, tuition is X and it's going to be a lot lower than tuition today. And if you push tuition above this, we will not allow you to use student loans to pay for that. It's simple, but it's devastating. It's devastating to colleges because colleges will have to lay off people. Colleges will have to uh, merge. Some colleges may uh, disappear. What can you do? And, and if that happens, if that happens, for the colleges that stay around, what will they look like? Well, instead of that very nice student-teacher type ratio that they have, think huge classrooms and um, laid off professors. Instead of bricks and mortar and uh, beautiful cafeterias and, uh, and dormitories, think online learning. Instead of the Rose Bowl, think no bowl. Instead of uh, college as we know it and feel comfortable with it and love it, think something I have no idea what it's going to look like. But it ain't going to look like what it looks like now. What can you do in the face of this brave new world? Well, the first thing you can do is save. Just like your parents and your grandparents did before there were student loans. 
And you know, let's not waste a crisis. Let's reform the scholarship system to uh, be motivational for savings. Right now, scholarships are tucked at the end of the whole high school process. You find out about what scholarships you get on the stage, just like this. The principal would be me. And he would hand out the scholarships, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars of scholarships across the country every year. It motivates no one. It comes too late. All the grades are in. The courses are over. Let's take that scholarship system and march it back to the seventh and eighth grade. So the people will know about the scholarships they get. It will motivate them to study harder, to save more. And that, plus the fact that we now, remember, have much lower tuition, and savings can get probably more kids into college than we do now in a much safer way, not based on leverage, but based on savings. A second thing you can do is talk to your colleges. Call them up as soon as you get out of TED Talks today and ask them, how dependent are they on student loans? And when they don't know, and they won't, talk to your alums, talk to members of your um, board of directors and say, there's still time to dial back our usage of student loans. There's still time to save our colleges. And then the final thing that you can do is uh, listen. Listen to people like Laura. Listen to their stories of how they got in the debt, what it's like now paying $700 a month, and how in the future it cuts their hopes, not for, just for themselves, but for their children. You know, this uh, reminds me of another crisis of youth that some of you will well remember. It happened about 40 years ago. It was the crisis of death. It was the crisis of AIDS. And a song came out, which is now part of the American Songbook, uh, which was called Seasons of Love. And it went something, it went exactly like this. 500 25,600 minutes. 500, 25,000 moments so dear. Well, now I look at this clock, which has gone up 3 million since I've been yakking, and I say to you, 1 trillion, 41 billion deaths of our children one trillion, four hundred billion threats to our schools. Thank you very much.